one's talking and no one is listening. How can we decide? There is a town in North Ontario. Neil Young spent his early childhood in Ontario. A few years later, he got a plastic ukulele for Christmas. He took to it immediately, then later moved to acoustic guitar. Neil did not fit in at school. He fought with bullies and got poor grades. But he loved rock and roll and started playing in local bands. I was just focused on doing the music, and that's all I really cared about. Neil dropped out of high school and devoted himself to music. His band, The Squires, achieved modest success on the local scene. Neil hauled his bandmates and their equipment around in an old hearse. At one gig, the Squires shared the bill with a group called The Company, whose singer and guitarist was an American named Stephen Stills. Neil and Stephen hit it off immediately and agreed to stay in touch. David Crosby was born on August 14, 1941, in Los Angeles, California. He was a real Hollywood wealthy kid. His mother was from the Van Cortland family, which is one of these very prestigious American families, and his father was a cinematographer in Hollywood. It said that he wasn't very academic at school, but he did love music from an early age and really kind of focused on it from the age of about 16. Jean Clark came from Tipton, Missouri. Jim McGuinn, who would later go by Roger McGuinn, was born on July 13, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois. When he heard the Beatles, McGuinn moved to LA and began to perform solo folk shows. And there he met Gene Clark, who went to see him, and they formed a duo together, and they played the Los Angeles folk circuit, particularly the Troubadour Club. One night, they were playing and harmonizing together, and David Crosby, with very much a privileged air, walked up on stage and started singing with them. Now, other people would have probably uh, kicked him aside, but the other two realized that the three of them blended vocals so brilliantly that they took him on and called themselves the Jets. You, move it on, you, move it on. Jim Dixon was a real mover and shaker on the Los Angeles folk rock scene. And he was also a friend of David Crosby. And he brought Jim Dixon in. And Jim Dixon promptly set about getting them a recording deal. He set about getting them concerts. And he set about finding songs for them. In 1964, Michael Clark joined the group on drums. Please Let Me Love You was a cash-in on the British invasion. So the name was changed from the Jet Set to the Beef Eaters because it's under British. And it went for this Beatles-esque sound. You know, it was the thing that was happening. Every kid in America was forming bands after they'd seen the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and it was exploding. But it didn't go anywhere. It wasn't a hit. In August 1964, their manager, Dixon, ended up getting his hands on an unreleased acetate of the Bob Dylan song, Mr. Tambourine Man, which he thought that the band should record. Jim Dixon got them a deal with Columbia so things were getting quite serious. But they realized that the Jet Set simply wasn't the right name for them. So at a Thanksgiving dinner, they sat around and discussed possibilities for a new name. And the one that they came up with was the birds. And the misspelling would echo the misspelling of the Beatles. The major difference between the single Mr. Tambourine Man and the album is that the birds played on the album and bar Roger McGuinn, they didn't play on the single. Terry Melcher, who was their producer, was not satisfied that the band was good enough. So he got the Wrecking Crew, which is the famous LA session musicians. The single Mr. Tambourine Man was a huge success. It was kind of the first rock folk crossover track and it went to number one in the US and also in the UK. The birds version of Mr. Tambourine Man is fantastic. You've got those amazing harmonies from Roger McGuinn, Gene Clark, and Crosby. I'm not sleepy and there ain't no place I'm going to. Very, very good playing because you've got the best session musicians in LA playing on it. And of course, you've got a fantastic song. So the combination was just perfect. While waiting for the release of Mr. Tambourine Man, the birds played a residency at Ciro's nightclub on Sunset Strip. They attracted a lot of the counterculture 
crowd. Peter Fonda was there, Lenny Bruce, Sonny and Sher, and they became the counterculture's Beatles at this point. When it came to recording the Mr. Tambourine album, then the birds had progressed musically, and so they played all the songs on it, including the new version of Mr. Tambourine Man. And there was Bells of Rimini, which was on it too. And at this moment, I think they invented folk rock. When the birds first toured Britain, they were billed as America's answer to the Beatles. Derek Taylor was the Beatles PR, and he was breaking the birds now. So his idea was that they were going to come over and they were going to... It was like Beatlemania came to America, so Birds Mania was going to come to the UK. The Birds weren't, at this time, a great live act. Gene Clark was good, but the rest were pretty statuesque. And, of course, the press were absolutely scathing about them because of this rather ludicrous claim that Derek Taylor had made on their behalf. The Birds' second single in October 1965 was a cover of Pete Seeger's Turn, 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 and it was their second number one. Uh, it's seen as being, you know, a high watermark of uh, folk rock, and um, I think, you know, at this point, they are almost untouchable. They're up there with some of the other biggest bands of the time. The real key was that it was received as a kind of anti-war anthem. basically a protest song really but a very gentle one so this is the time of Vietnam War so it really became a kind of anthem of this very young emerging counterculture to everything turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. turn 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 the album was also a big hit it was US number 17 UK number 11 the recording sessions for it were quite fractious. Gene Clark was getting more money than the rest of the band because he was writing more songs. And this caused frustration, particularly because Jim McGuinn saw himself as the band's leader. The single Eight Miles High was originally recorded by the Birds at RCA Studios, but Columbia weren't happy that they'd used somebody else's studio, so they forced them to re-record it. Uh, something which the band were quite unhappy with. Roger McGuinn said, oh, well, it's about air travel because that's how high a plane travels. But I think you would have to be very innocent not to also associate it with the emerging LSD and, you know, cannabis fueled counterculture. The Birds' third album, Fifth Dimension, was released in July 1966. Fifth Dimension was received very well by its core audience, but not so well by a lot of US radio stations who banned it because of its uh, druggy connotations. Eight Miles High was on there, Fifth Dimension. There was Jim McGinn's constant fondness for Indian music, which was seeping just under the surface. There was his affection for John Coltrane, which was making them slightly more avant-garde. The usual thing for bands is to progress from being counterculture to mainstream. At this point, the birds were going the other way, from being very mainstream to being much more counterculture. I won't do anything wrong. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along for a ride? So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star, the first single from the fourth album, Younger Than Yesterday, was quite a cynical look at pop stardom, but also the pop stardom that the birds themselves had gone through. For example, Chris Hillman had very frizzy hair, and to be a bird, he actually had to iron his hair every night to get that pudding bowl look. Ostensibly, it was based on the monkeys, but the monkeys had only had one album out at this time. It was really about the process that they'd gone through. Of 
Chris Hillman, who was stooped in country music, was coming to the fore as a songwriter for the first time and as a lead singer for the first time, up until then it mainly been McGuinn and Crosby. At this time, Jim McGuinn became Roger McGuinn after he joined Subu, which was a, an Indonesian religion. Lady Friend was one of David Crosby's songs and it stalled at number 82, so this is a great bash to his ego. And he kind of looked around for other people to blame and the first person he thought of was Gary Usher, who was the producer, and he said, oh, the production's wrong. You know, well, this is what happens. I mean, when there's a hit, everyone takes the credit for it. And when there's a flop, it's, you know, it's the other guy's fault. And this is completely what Crosby was doing. In Toronto, Neil met a bass player named Bruce Palmer. They both ended up in an R&B group called the Minor Birds. The lead singer was an American named Ricky James, who would become famous years later as funk star Rick James. It included future members of the group Steppenwolf and an up-and-coming singer-songwriter named Neil Young. Music is really colorblind. The band signed a record deal with Motown and recorded several songs, including the Minor Bird Hop. This rare recording is the only evidence of this once promising band. The Minor Birds drove down to Detroit and auditioned for Motown. I was playing a 12 string. I must have had the first acoustic 12 string at. Uh, at uh, Motown. Rick was great. I mean, he was out front and Bruce and I were playing. It was a good band. Good, really good beat. Motown signed them, but it was too good to be true. It turned out that Rick James was a deserter from the Naval Reserves. When the feds realized he was back in the States, they arrested him. I think Rick got busted for dodging the draft and, uh, and our, our manager OD'd. That happened kind of at the same time. So that was the end of our Motown era. Neil and Bruce Palmer sold the Minor Birds equipment and used the money to drive Neil's hearse to Los Angeles. Neil wanted to find Stephen Stills and start a new band, but he had no idea where to look for it. While stuck in a traffic jam on the Sunset Strip, Stills spotted Neil's hearse. Well, we, uh, Bruce and I came to Los Angeles in an old hearse to, uh, start, you know, to try to, you know, make stars, you know, we're going to be stars. So, uh, we were just about to leave, and I saw him in a van going the other way on Sunset, and he stopped me, and we stopped, and we all stopped, and then we started. In 1966, Neil Young teamed up with Stephen Stills to form one of the greatest California rock bands, Buffalo Springfield. There's something happening here. The Springfield There's found immediate success, but conflicts the between there. the two stars, Stills and Young, combined with Young's desire for a solo career, caused tension from the start. Still said later that he wanted to be in the Beatles and Neil wanted to be Bob Dylan. The relationship was a bunch of 19 and 20 year old guys just getting something together for the first time in the spotlight of, you know, interviews and, and uh, you know, attention that they never had before. We lost the ability to stay in the moment, you know, which is what you have to do to perform. In 1967, the Birds compilation Greatest Hits album came out, and it was a huge success. It went top 10 in the charts, and I think showed that there was a real thirst for what the Birds had been producing previously. It was like going back and remembering how good they'd been at the beginning of their career. Tensions really got to a height during the recording of the Notorious Bird Brothers. Crosby's egotism was getting to the other band members, and then it was the Monterey Pop Festival where it really reached a height. Young walked out on the Buffalo Springfield just before the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. Stephen asked David Crosby of the Birds to fill in. Neil had split, and Stephen, you know, and I knew each other and liked each other. And uh, he said, "Well, you know, you want to like? I got, we got to do this gig. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. You got to do this." And, uh, and uh, I said, "Yeah, I'll sing with Crosby was also performing at the festival with the Birds, who were at the height of their success. Crosby was having troubles with his bandmates, Chris Hillman and Roger McGuinn. Troubles that were magnified by his performing with Buffalo Springfield. 
On stage, he kept lecturing the audiences about the JFK assassination and that everyone should take LSD, you know, LSD should be given to all the senators of the world and all this kind of thing. What really did it was when he appeared on stage with the Buffalo Springfield, who was really the bird's arch rivals. That was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as Crosby was concerned. And Chris Hillman and Roger McGuinn had to go to his house and tell him that he was sacked. I remember it being a very kind of sour experience. It was sad on stage. There was the, the camaraderie that we'd had as a band wasn't there anymore. It was David Crosby's uh, wanting to be in what became Crosby, Stills and Nash that really drove the, uh, the situation to an end. There was some friction there, you know, and uh, also, I just, I've never been, you know, the, the easiest person in the world. I'm very opinionated and a uh, very independent guy. Eight miles high, and when you touch down... They uh, said, you know, we'd rather do it without you. And I said, well, you're making a terrific mistake, you know. They said, well, we think we'll do better without you. When Buffalo Springfield split for good, Crosby and Stills decided to team up. We sort of found ourselves spending a lot of time together and driving around and, uh, and uh, you know, and singing songs. And basically, me and Cross were hanging out. And we went and saw Graham sing with the Hollies. And then Cass comes up and whispers to me, do you think you guys need the harmony singer? Cass Elliott of the Mamas and the Papas introduced David and Stephen to the English pop star Graham Nash. Graham had been a member of the Hollies since the early 60s. But by 1968, he was beginning to feel the limitations the group was putting on him. When uh, I made the decision to leave the Hollies, three things had happened. One, I was getting frustrated that I was writing songs that I thought were pretty cool and that they didn't want to record. Secondly, they wanted to do an entire album of Bob Dylan songs in a kind of Las Vegas horn section, swing band kind of thing. And the third thing is that I'd actually been befriended by this uh, teddy bear called David Crosby. Cass Elliott said, get in the car. I want you to meet somebody. She brought him over and, and told me to uh, get him stoned. On his chest was a lid from a shoebox. And in the lid was a pile of dope. I had this pullover pot, meaning if you smoked some and you were going someplace, you'd pull over and try to remember where you were going. It was stung our weed. So we, we laughed all through the afternoon. And I liked him a lot. In the summer of 1968, Crosby, Stills, and Nash sang together for the first time at a house in Laurel Canyon, belonging to either Cass Elliott or Joni Mitchell. Nobody is absolutely sure. Now, this is possibly because we might have smoked one, but uh, no, none of us is absolutely sure whether it was Joni's or Cass's. I say it was Joni's. See, David got it wrong. It was at Cass's house where we sang together. In the morning when you arrived, we had, you know, I had a pretty good harmony too, and uh, we sang it to Graham. And he went, do that again, would you? In the morning, and the third time, he put the top part on. And Steve and I looked at each other and went. Before Crosby, Stills, and Nash could make their group official, Graham had to go back to England to quit the Hollies. David and Stephen joined him in London. We got to Britain to rehearse, you know, and there were like fans that would spot us in a car and, and, and holler things at us because we were blowing up one of their groups, you know. Oh, those horrible Americans. I didn't know it was that big a deal. <laughs> oh, just a band. The trio rehearsed their songs and started looking for label interest. We did attempt at one point to get on Apple Records. It was an up-and-coming uh, new record label, obviously uh, controlled by the Beatles and Peter Asher at the time. We actually auditioned for George and Peter. And we sang it very well, and they passed, which I think they probably, in hindsight, were not happy about. <laughs> Amit Erdogan of Atlantic Records had loved Buffalo Springfield and offered the new group a contract. Crosby, Stills and Nash settled in Los Angeles to record their first album. We knew that we were doing something really unusual. We knew the songs were really good. And uh, we were totally thrilled, man. It was the year of the guitar player, you gotta understand. This was a year when Clapton and Hendrix and, and uh, Jimmy Page and people like that were it. You know, and uh, for us to come out from left field with this, you know, three-part harmony and a lot of acoustic stuff, you know, it's a pretty unexpected thing. 
It was great. The music was wonderful, but the dynamic between the three strong personalities was explosive. And you walked out two days in a row, you hypocrite. I have my own weirdnesses and crazinesses, but it, it's not as volatile as David and Stevens. So we settled into that role, you know. Uh, David and Stephen over the years uh, have uh, loved each other to death. We disagree about a lot of stuff, but we're brothers. I love him. He loves me. You know? And brothers fight. In May of 1969, the band released their debut. Sweet Judy Blue Eyes and Marrakesh Express were AM hits. FM radio played the entire album. The music of Crosby, Stills and Nash became the sound of the counterculture. Within a few months, David, Stephen, and Graham would be more famous than they had ever been with their previous bands. They had never performed live when an offer came in to appear at a summer music festival in upstate New York. Crosby, Stills, and Nash said yes. Their performance at Woodstock would change everything. In the summer of 1969, Crosby, Stills, and Nash released their first album to immense critical and commercial acclaim. Then it was time for the group to tour. Stills had overdubbed lead guitar, keyboards, and bass on the album. They would need other musicians to perform the songs on stage. It was Atlantic Records president Ahmed Erdogan who suggested Stevens' former bandmate Neil Young would be the perfect addition. I'd been casting about for a keyboard player. I wanted another musician to play off of. But I'm talking it over with Ahmed one day. And Ahmed says, why don't you get Neil? I'm like, didn't we just go through this? Stephen decided that Ahmed was right. David and Graham were not so sure. We had an interview with Neil in Greenwich Village on Bleecker Street. And I went to breakfast with Neil because I was the one that was mainly against it. Because I didn't, I didn't see what we needed from Neil. You know, the blend that we had with our voices was uh, pretty good. Uh, and our musicianship was pretty good. And by the time I'd finished uh, breakfast with Neil, I would have given him the world. He was unbelievably brilliant and of course i loved his music helpless, helpless, helpless. in songs how are you not going to invite him in you know listen to the songs man good lord i'd ask him to join the group if i had 25 people in it Neil had begun to establish himself as a solo artist, but the chance to team up with his old Buffalo Springfield partner was too tempting to resist. Oh, I thought it'd be cool to play with Steven again, and the other guys were great singers and had their own songs and everything. But I, I really felt like I had some unfinished stuff with Steven, and we play together, and we, you know, we needed to do more of that. The band officially changed its name to Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young, and went to perform their first gig in Chicago. One week later, they had their second performance at Woodstock. This gig had come up, and it was a kind of a shaky deal. Nobody was sure what was going to happen. We just knew that some of our favorite bands were going to play there. They were all standing right behind us. And uh, they'd all heard the record, but we'd never played live before. And so they said, okay, well, let's see, can they do it? It's getting to the point where But when the camera set up to shoot the band's historic performance, Neil Young refused to be filmed. I was offended by the cameras all over the place because it was a distraction to what we were doing, which was playing the music. And so I told them not to do that with me, that not to film me, don't bother, you know, don't come near me and, uh, you know, stay out of the way. After Woodstock, the band's reputation grew with every show they performed. No privacy, no respect for the sanctuary, the dressing room. Look at them. No, you got to run. Within a month after their first gig, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young were superstars. Their performance in New York's Fillmore East created such pandemonium the crowds refused to leave the venue. Concert promoter Bill Graham began stuffing money underneath the dressing room doors until the band returned to the stage.
In September, the group went to San Francisco to record an album, but the mood had changed. Four and twenty years ago, come into this life. The son of a woman and a man who lived in strife. He was tired of being poor. David suffered a huge loss when his girlfriend Christine Hinton was killed in a car accident. When I made Deja Vu, I was very sad. My girlfriend uh, had just been killed. And a lot of the time, I would come into the studio and just sit on the floor and cry. I wasn't very together. I'm amazed that we did as good a work as we did. The band managed to finish their album, but it was a tough time to begin the longest tour any of them had ever been on. Deja Vu was released in March of 1970, at the same time the Beatles broke up. CSNY were rock's new superstars. Their singles Woodstock, Our House, and Teach Your Children were all over radio. They were the symbol of peace and love, except between themselves. Well, you know, there was one time in Denver where we had some, some trouble about rehearsals or something, and they had booked the tour, and once again, that never really works for us, because the first day we were rehearsing with a new bass player. Once we got to know the guy and started playing with him, it was great. So there was, there was a big fight around then. We used to fight a lot, sort of like a hockey team, you know? The puck's flying around, the Neil Pills is a great metaphor for playing hockey. And the team's really clicking and everything, and then all of a sudden, the, the gloves are up and they're all fighting, and then they pick them back up, and they go back to playing hockey again. It's kind of like that. In May of 1970, the band recorded what would become their most profound political statement, a reaction to the shooting of four Kent State college students at an anti-war rally. We finally on our own. This summer I give a drowning for dead in Ohio. I was at this house in uh, in a canyon on the California coast. Crosby came up and he had the magazine with the Kent State Killings cover on it. And I'd heard it on the news, but Crosby uh, always has a way of bringing things into focus. That's what woke me up to that there was something going on there that I had some thoughts about. We started writing a song. And when it was done, I called uh, Nash, I think, and said, get the studio, get any studio, get it now. We're on our way. And we cut it, and it was out in a week. Ohio ratified CSNY's position as the voice of the counterculture. Deja Vu was selling in the millions. Their concerts were rallies, rock shows, political events. But Neil was gearing up to restart his solo career with his new album, After the Gold Rush. In July, the CSNY tour ended, and so did the band. They were living legends. They had been together one year. We got together at a certain point in time, and it had a huge effect on a lot of people, including ourselves. And then, uh, but we always planned from the beginning to go off in the different directions and do different things, and it just was a loose organization. By the time the live album Four Way Street was released, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young were all making solo records. When we started, we used our own names because we intended to continue with solo careers. All of us. And every time we did it, they'd say, oh, they broke up. We were never together. But I thought that was, that was kind of cool to give ourselves, you know, some air. And that's why we used all of our last names. If there was any plan at all, that was the only one. In the aftermath of CSNY, all four had hit solo albums.
While Stills and Young were leading their own bands, Crosby and Nash began making music together as a duo. David and I knew that we had a musical link, and we always have and always will have. There's probably nobody currently that sings harmony the way Nash and I do, or can. It's easy to make music with David because we think so similarly. It was a joy. We had great songs, starting with uh, the first uh, Graham Nash David Crosby record. Young's solo music propelled him to the top of the charts. In time, his association with Crosby, Stills and Nash began to seem like a brief side trip in what was always essentially a solo career. All the people that I play with, they all know me that, that I'm moving along and that I may not stay forever and that I might be back. And, you know, as long as everybody knows that from the beginning, it's great to see everybody and a change is good for music. So real musicians understand that and they don't uh, worry whether you're playing with them this year or not. I want to live, I want to give, I've been a miner for a heart of gold. The only one of us who's gone off on his own and been really successful is Neil, and he's done that brilliantly. In 1973, Neil was on the road when he called on David and Graham to join him. After the tour, the trio contacted Stephen, and they all ended up in Hawaii. They began recording new songs, going so far as to shoot an album cover photo. But the reunion was not to be. When people planned things for us to do, thinking that, oh, what a great opportunity, sometimes it didn't work out, you know, because it was that we weren't looking at life that way at that time. Wind blowing through my sails. The relationship between Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Neil is, is very much like a frozen pond. The ice gets a certain thickness, and if you wait long enough, it will bear your weight. But if you put too much weight on it, you'll go through. The four musicians scrapped the album, but agreed to tour. The demand for tickets was enormous. For the first time ever, a rock group would do an entire tour of football stadiums. So we change, partners. Time to change. Again. The tour was a huge success. When it was over, the group convened in Los Angeles to make an album. Shortly after the recording began, Neil disappeared. We started it, we cut two tunes. Neil said he'd show up the next day, never saw him again. Everybody has to feel it at the same time for it to really be what it is. I mean, I think it's really great that that people have, have wanted CSNY to be together over the years, and I think that's a, a testimony to what, that it was worth it when we did get together. But you have to want to. After those sessions fell apart, the band members went their separate ways. Move along quick, it furthers one to have somewhere to go. A year later, Stephen was on tour with his own band when Neil showed up. After years as being part of Buffalo Springfield and CSNY, Stephen and Neil began recording as Stills and Young. We make lots of room for each other and we listen to each other and there's little spheres of influences, you know, and Neil and I have a way of saying things in three sentences that it might him, take him and David all day to get to. Stephen and Neil have a special chemistry the same way that Nash and I do. And I love you. I love you. I do. Stephen's always wanted to work with Neil and I think he always will. And I think that goes both ways. After recording a few songs, Stills and Young invited Crosby and Nash down to Miami to join the sessions. Once again, talk of a CSNY album and tour began. Can you take but David and Graham had signed a deal with ABC Records and had to finish an album for them first. They left Miami to finish the Crosby-Nash album, Wind on the Water, and in their absence, Neil and Stephen erased their vocals from the recorded tracks. David and Graham were hurt and angry. Neil and Stephen released Long May You Run by the Stills Young Band and went out on the road. We've been through some things together. It was a great record, and then the tour got going along pretty good, and we were moving so fast, though, there was no time to rehearse up anything new, so the set never changed. After a few weeks, Neil quit the tour. He left Stephen a telegram that said, Funny how some things that start spontaneously end that way. Eat a peach, Neil. Neil's sense of humor, it certainly wasn't... I certainly knew him too well to let him hurt my feelings. 
like that with a little bit of verbal jousting. I left the tour in the middle of the tour, and uh, there was something inherent. Something was wrong. Something was wrong with the whole thing, and uh, and it, it wasn't working. The balance was off in some way, so you know I bailed on. Mm -hmm. Neil got frustrated, and then he got sick, and he said, "Well, that's it. I'm off." You know, and he's uh, you know he's got more nerve than I I do. I can't I can't just bolt like that. Stephen was left shaken. Not only had Neil left him holding the bag on the rest of the Still's young dates, but he had done what had seemed like irreparable damage to his relationship with David and Graham. Stephen showed up at a Crosby Nash concert and managed to patch things up with David and Graham. Crosby, Stills, and Nash decided to pick up where they left off after their first album in 1969, as a trio. In 1976, they made CSN. She has seen me changing. It was a big hit. Neil Young was back to being a solo artist. Crosby, Stills, and Nash were back to being a group. It was a pretty good time. I remember recording the, the CSN record in, in, in uh, Criteria Studios in Miami. We had, we'd rented this villa. We had great songs. We were having a great time. Just a song before I go To who it may Traveling twice the speed of sound Just a Song Before I Go was CSN's biggest hit ever. The band was back on top and exhilarated to be there. But David's drug use was escalating to dangerous levels. I was just shifting in the bad habit from snorting cocaine to freebasing cocaine, which is even worse. And I was in a very good place with my music. Uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash was doing uh, the CSN album. But by the end of the 70s, Graham had had enough. We were at a Crosby, Nash recording session. The band started to jam. David was free basing, uh, and his pipe was on an amp. And the jam session was so vibrant and so hot that the amp was shaking, and it was slowly shaking the pipe towards the edge of the amp. Then the pipe fell off and shattered onto the ground, and David stopped the music. Dope had gotten more important to me than music something which I swore would never happen in my life. And at that moment, I knew that David was in deep trouble and that if David was in deep trouble, we were all in deep trouble. When he stopped that jam from going forward, a door shut in my mind. That was the time I told David that I couldn't make music with him anymore. Graham Nash was David Crosby's most loyal friend and defender. If David was so far gone that even Graham gave up on him, it looked to everyone like Crosby, Stills and Nash were gone for good. 1981, Crosby, Stills, and Nash were divided again, this time because of David Crosby's drug addiction. Stephen Stills and Graham Nash decided to record a duo album. Daylight again. Graham and I were totally, we're just gonna make a Stills Nash record. It's the only combination we haven't done. Can't blame him, man. That was right near the end of my drug use days, and I was about as dysfunctional as a human being could be and not be dead. We handed it into Atlantic Records, and they said, no, we want a CSN record. I said, there is no Crosby. He's gone. He said, well, we don't want the record. So now we're $600,000 in a record out of our own money, right? And I talked with Stephen, I said, what, what should we do? And then we had to make room for Dave, you know, and he changed some things that I really wish he hadn't, and then there were some other things that were, that were great additions. It came out much better than it should have. Crosby was in bad shape, but with his friend's help, he made it through the sessions. The finished album included a song by Graham that documented how he felt about the whole saga of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Wasted on the way, um, I wrote, as a reaction to the amount of time that me and David and Stephen, and me and David and Stephen and Neil have wasted over the years. We have made a lot of good music, I'm not denying that, but we have wasted a lot of time. We have wasted a lot of love, and we have wasted a lot of life. So much Let the water come.
The fact that I turn it into a hit record is, 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 is almost silly, considering what it's really about. Between 1982 and 1985, David was arrested five times on various drug and weapons related charges, but his habit persisted. The trio toured on and off whenever David was well enough. He always tried to be there 100%. And he didn't always make it, but I do believe that the compensation factor of me and Stephen wanting to be stronger and better because our partner was hurting equaled everything out to me. In 1985, Crosby, Stills and Nash had a bittersweet reunion with Neil Young at Live Aid. A lot of times um, that I would rather not remember, that's, that one wasn't the worst one. There were other times that were much worse. But you know, there were a lot of times when I did not do anywhere near what I'm capable of doing. Young tried to help Crosby as others had. It was no use. He came up to my house in Mill Valley and uh, said, listen man, I know you're kind of scared to go to the hospital and all that, but why don't you come down to my place? You can, you can kick all this stuff there. And he took the time out to try and help save my life. You know, we, we all care about each other a lot. Neil offered to do another CSNY album if David managed to clean up. Instead, David went on the run from the police, ending up on his boat in Florida. When he was on the boat, contemplating escaping and therefore never coming back into American society and being a fugitive at large, a federal fugitive, running out of food, running out of money. The decision that he made to walk off his boat into the nearest FBI office was the point at which David recognized that he desperately, desperately needed help. In December of 1985, David turned himself in and was extradited to a Texas prison. I prayed for him as much as I do. He got through it and then, well, facing the inevitable and then he got through it. I don't want to be the recovery poster boy. I'm not. I, I'm one of the lucky few that you know, was given a chance to get away from it and did. And I took a year in prison and a hell of a lot of meetings and a lot of help from my friends. In 1986, David emerged from prison clean and sober. Neil kept his word in the quartet regrouped to record American Dream. As a gesture of friendship, it was wonderful. But musically, it was not the triumphant reunion fans had waited 16 years to hear. It was part of a bargain that, uh, that we would get together if David got straightened out. I don't remember a bit of it. And I'd really rather not discuss it. We really didn't get together. We were just in the same area. It didn't work for some more reasons than I can count. Valiant effort, but it didn't work. CSNY did not tour in support of American Dream. Young went back to his solo career, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash returned to the road. Chipping away, little by little, day by day. Then in 1994, David was dealt another terrible blow. I was very sick, and I didn't know it. I was dying, and I didn't know it. My liver was probably half gone, and we had no idea why I kept wanting to lie down and rest. Crosby finally went to the hospital and was told his liver was failing and that he was probably going to die. He'd need all the luck in the world just to survive. For Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young to ever make music again, it would take a miracle. In 1994, the future of Crosby, Stills & Nash was in doubt, as David Crosby's health was in serious decline. I went to UCLA. They sat me down and he said, David, what the deal is, is you have hepatitis C and your liver is just about destroyed and you're going to die unless you get a transplant uh, fairly soon. And he put me on the list and we started to wait. David's friends stuck with him through his ordeal with Graham Nash keeping vigil at his bedside. The head of, uh, of medicine at UCLA called me one day and said, um, we found a liver for David. Do you want to? We're going to prep him. Do you want to come? I wish him the best, and I go to the door, and I turn around, and I says, now look, don't you 
leave me with stills. And he burst out laughing and I burst out laughing. Crosby's will to live prevailed again. He made it through the operation, got a new liver and regained his health. The puzzling part isn't my descent and rise. The puzzling part is, is the amazing good luck that has happened and continues to happen in my life. I am an incredibly fortunate man. When David was well enough, Crosby, Stills and Nash returned to the road. In 1997, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Then they were dropped by Atlantic Records. When we signed with Atlantic Records in 1969, we signed for six records, and I think we've only just done six records, and it's 30 years later. The last couple of records that Atlantic put out of ours, I didn't think that they cared about at all. And so we wanted a clean break, and uh, we wanted a fresh start. I don't think it's fair to blame just uh, that one record company. They all went through the same metamorphosis. These guys are lawyers and accountants. And they haven't had a clue about music. Crosby, Stills and Nash decided that they wanted to make new music with or without a new record deal. In 1998, they put up their own money and began recording. Then Stills got a call from Neil Young, who was working on a Buffalo Springfield box set. The two old friends got together at Neil's ranch to listen to the tapes of their first band. Basically, we were reliving our childhood, and I played in this new song that I was working on and asked him if he would come down and help uh, David and Graham and I, uh, you know, cut that. I thought that was a cool idea, so a few weeks later I, uh, I went down there and I actually didn't even call him. I just waited until I was well on my way down there and then called him from a roadhouse. Young began recording with Crosby, Stills and Nash, and soon they had more than an album's worth of material. I go, Neil, this is not you guesting on the CSN record anymore. What are we doing? She said, well, looks like we're heading into a CSNY record, doesn't it? Looking forward, all that I can see is good things happening to you and to me. The third studio album by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young was released in the fall of 1999. The group had made one album in the 70s, one in the 80s, and one at the end of the 90s. They called it Looking Forward. It speaks to everything that I'm feeling. I'm, I want to look forward. I've done enough explaining what we did wrong in our middle years. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to, to how much fun we're going to have rediscovering the joy of being together. CSNY agreed to tour for the first time in 25 years. But the dates were put on hold when Graham Nash broke both of his legs in a freak boating accident. I must tell you that as a musician, this was one of the strangest sounds I ever heard when I broke my legs. And I thought, I've really hurt myself here. I did not think about the tour. I didn't think about anything. Graham had been sailing with his family when a storm came up. He was thrown in the air by the waves. When he landed back in the boat, he shattered his legs. It was a two-hour journey back after the accident on the boat to port. And the way that I dealt with it was I chose to ignore everything below my waist. I went in my mind to a great sunset and my land in Hawaii with its waterfalls and, and uh, the beauty of it. And the two hours passed very quickly. Nash's recovery was difficult, but his spirit was strong and carried him through. The year 2000 brought another medical surprise from David Crosby, but this time it was a happy one. The man who came back from near death by drugs in the 80s and liver disease in the 90s was revealed to be the secret birth father of the children of singer Melissa Etheridge and her partner, Julie Seifer. Crosby told in a maze world, fatherhood is the wildest ride I've ever been on, and that's saying something. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young had beaten the odds so many times, it would be hard to ever count them out again. In spite of all their battles, all their talent, and all the temptations that came with success, in the long run, the music they made and the love between them was always strong enough to bring them back together. I must tell you that the feeling between the four of us has never been better. We are more compassionate with each other. We're more understanding of our own weaknesses and strengths. We are more sensitive. Nash is, is you know, a gentleman. And I would have always put him at the center of the group. I think he's the central guy. Graham, he's really uh, great in the studio. and He works really hard to keep things going, keep things organized. Steven, explosive, brilliant, you know, passionate guitar player, musician, singer, writer, 
How can you compete with Stephen Stills? He's a great musician. You can't compete. You can't compete with Neil. Neil's a brilliant, deep guy, but a huge creative force, and he changes the chemistry. And uh, Stephen uh, uh, is just my bro. I mean, and I love to play guitar with him. Between the three of them, they're just never going to let me down. You know, we're just different. You know, and we make lots of room for each other, and we listen to each other really assiduously, like we did when we first started when we were kids. David is uh, more uh, the uh, soul, of the, the catalyst in the spiritual uh, level of things, you know, in some ways, to me. I'm kind of a lunatic. I, I can't categorize myself very well. Mother Earth will swallow you. Lay your body down. I'm Gary Burton, but I'm an artist. I make album covers and I make pictures of the music. I'm Henry Diltz. I'm a photographer. The photographic half of this duo. All through the middle 60s, taking pictures was just a daily thing, you know. I usually hung out with Gary every day. We'd get in the car and we'd go to, you know, David Crosby's house or Stephen Stills' house or Mama Cass's house or we'd just go different places and hang out and that in turn would lead to going somewhere else. We'd all go to lunch, meet somebody, go to their house. Gary was called by a guy at the record company and we were supposed to go take a picture of Richard Pryor for an album cover. We wanted to go to the snow, so the three of them and Henry and I and Joni Mitchell drove up to Big Bear. We were there for like two hours in this car. I mean, I just kept taking pictures so that I wouldn't go crazy. When it came time to do Blue, she wanted to try something different about Southern California and the American desert. And so we made it this great adventure. You know, this is not history, this is evidence. 